Okay, so we're going to talk about Roman numeral four, the brain, starting with the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is this upper portion of the brain. Most of our brain's mass is the cerebrum, and there are two hemispheres. There is the right and left hemisphere of the brain. They're separated by a deep groove called the longitudinal fissure, and they're connected by commissural fibers. So the two, the right and left halves of our brain, or the right and left hemispheres, are connected by commissural fibers. We'll look at those in a second. The cerebrum has white and gray matter. And let's talk about uh, the cerebral cortex. So when you look at a picture of the brain here and you're looking at the surface of the brain, what you're looking at is the cerebral cortex, right? It's the upper six layers of the brain. It is all gray matter. So we're gonna talk about uh, gray matter, white matter. Gray matter is unmyelinated, right? Does not have the myelin sheath around it uh, and the conduction system is a little bit slower and myelinated fibers is white uh, areas of the brain and they, the conduction uh, is faster in the white regions. And I'm gonna go into detail about that in chapter 13. Okay, so if we look at um, the picture here, actually let's begin here, we can see that there are different lobes of the brain. Uh, there are different color codes to the lobes of the brain. Um, so I'm gonna skip the association areas for now and just start in on the lobes. So I'm going to skip number four for now, but go into number five. Remember those bumps are called gyri, and remember those shallow grooves are called sulci. <clears throat> All right, let's look at the frontal lobe. So number one, the frontal lobe is everything here in obviously the front or the anterior portion of our brain. It's going to be color coded in this sort of peachy color. Um, it's separated from the parietal lobe by the central sulcus. So there is a groove that runs down both hemispheres of the brain on both sides, kind of like a headband, and it's called the central sulcus. Um, and anything in front of that is considered the frontal lobe. Behind it will be the parietal lobe here in blue. They, um, the frontal lobe can be separated into a couple of different regions. The prefrontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex is this region here that is sort of this beige color. This prefrontal cortex, which is above your eyes, is where they believe, right, neurobiologists believe that there is our higher intellectual functions are here, our logic, our rationality, our personality, um, our planning, um, you know, skills in logic, those are here. So the frontal lobe, in the prefrontal cortex, has this um, aspect, this function to it. Behind it, though, in this region, this is all motor, and in fact, it is voluntary motor. So this is known as the, so this dark, dark uh, red area, this is known as the motor cortex, the primary motor cortex, which is where you initiate all voluntary muscle control. So when you think about moving your hand or smiling, anything that's skeletal muscle, that thought begins here. So that's why it's called the primary motor cortex. So the frontal lobe has two major jobs, uh, higher intellectual function and motor control. So let's look at the um, Broca's area, which is outlined for you here. So Broca's area is going to be an area found within the frontal, oops, within the frontal lobe. Um, it's gonna be this dotted region right here, so you can see Broca's area. And the reason why it's outlined is because this is the area that is for speech, making speech possible. Now, that's not understanding speech, it's not forming sentences, it's physically talking. So the must, this red area, right, so our red area is motor, this is gonna be the motor commands to our tongue. So let's say if you had damage here, if you had a stroke that um, damaged this region, you would be able to understand somebody, you would be able to read, you could be able to formulate the sentences in your mind, but you would not be able to physically say them, right? Because Broca's area controls the musculature of your tongue and your mouth. All right, let's move on uh, to, oh, so the picture that's in your outline, Phineas, um, gauge here was the reason why we kind of know the prefrontal cortex is for personality and it's where personality lies because in the picture you can see that there is a accident that Phineas Gage um, was involved in and the metal rod went straight through his uh, prefrontal cortex here and 
he survived the accident, but his personality completely changed. So um, unfortunately, a lot of the knowledge that we gain from the brain is through other people's misfortune or other people's accidents or diseases. And when you find out that one area of their brain is responsible for their symptoms, then we kind of get that knowledge and um, we can start to you know, put different areas of the brain to different tasks. All right, so let's look at number two, the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe in this picture is blue. Uh, the darkest is called the primary somatosensory cortex. Um, you can also just abbreviate to primary sensory cortex. And this is all the information that comes from our body. Um, so kind of like our touch, um, itch, stretch, things like that. So this is um, the somatic part of your body, which is going to be your skin, your muscles, your bones, whatever you feel in those areas will come into this region. Okay, so the somatosensory cortex receives sensory information. All right, so the rest of it is going to be involved in um, sort of comprehending and making sense of that sensory information coming in. Number three, the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobe is going to be this side lobe here. Let me go back to the um, other. So here is our parietal lobe in blue. The temporal lobe is being uh, oh, sort of shoved aside here. Um, so the deep groove that we are sort of opening up is called the lateral fissure or the lateral sulcus or the sylvian fissure. But that's going to be that groove that separates the temporal lobe away from the frontal and parietal lobe. So what does the temporal lobe do? It is uh, primarily involved in audit it's called the primary auditory cortex. Auditory meaning hearing. So when you hear something in your ear will send an, uh, electrical impulses into the temporal lobe and the temporal lobe will make sense of what you hear. So the auditory cortex. There is a special region that I'm going to show you in the next slide called Wernicke's area. So this dotted line here, this is Wernicke's area. Wernicke's is going to be the area where we understand speech and understand the written language. So damage here would mean that you would not be able to understand what someone is saying to you, right? You might be able to form words yourself you can't understand the written language and you can't understand someone talking to you. Not the same as Broca's, right? Broca's is you can understand, but you just can't physically talk. So those are two sort of distinct areas of the brain that you should know for the upcoming exam. Let's look at the um, occipital lobe. So the occipital lobe, let me actually just go back to the color picture in green is going to be the visual cortex. So what you see with your eyes uh, is really not what you see because you actually see with your brain. So your eyes are going to pick up um, a random, you know, the, the images from the outside world. It falls onto the retina. The retina is going to send electrical signals to the occipital lobe. So what your brain is receiving is basically just electricity, right? Electricity coming in in different areas, at different temp tempos, at different times. And it's going to receive that information here within the very dark green area called the visual cortex. And then it's going to integrate information coming from different areas, right? So this, let's talk about these association areas now. So association areas, like you see visual association, you see somatic association, you see auditory association. Those are areas where you associate the information coming in with other parts of your brain. So let's say that you see um, a Toyota Corolla, right? So you physically see this car. Um, do you know it's a car? Do you know it's your car? Uh, do you know it's low on gas? All those things that are associated with this car, the association areas have to talk to the memory of your brain. They have to talk to the emotional content of the brain. Maybe you love this car, maybe you hate this car, um, but you have an emotional response to the car, that's going to be because, due to because of the association areas. So all of these lobes will have an association area, and those areas are to associate what's coming directly into that lobe with other regions of the brain. So I hope that makes sense, right? So your car, you know it's a car because you have to reach into memory 
to tell you that what that is. You have to reach into maybe your emotional region to have an emotional response to the brick, to the car, etc. All right, so let's look at the last lobe here. This last lobe everybody forgets about. It's called the insula. So the reason why this image is being opened up like that is to look at our last lobe, the insula. The insula you can think of it as insulated, right? It's inside the brain. It's hiding. It's the gustatory cortex. Gustation is the taste um, sense that we have. So this is an area that really um, processes taste. It also has a role in equilibrium and language. All right. So let's take a look at um, this image, right? So now that we know, we can see our, our frontal lobe here we can see the central sulcus. Remember that deep groove, so it goes through both sides, and behind this is gonna be our parietal lobe. Oh, let me go back and actually make sure you know something. This first gyrus in front of the central sulcus is called the primary motor cortex. You need to know this. This is also called the pre-central gyrus. Behind the central sulcus in the parietal lobe, we have this one, the very first gyrus here in dark blue. This is called the primary somatosensory cortex or post central gyrus. All right, so you need to know those two specific gyri and their jobs, of course, or their functions are to initiate skeletal muscle contraction so you can control voluntary muscle control. And this one is the first to receive sensory information coming in from the body. All right. So we can see that here at the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, we can see that lateral sulcus, the groove separating the temporal lobe away from the rest of the lobes, frontal and parietal lobe. All right, so what's interesting is your brain doesn't give different parts of your body the same amount of attention. Your brain gives certain parts of your body more attention than others. And if you can see from the image here, your face and your mouth and your tongue and your hands get a lot of attention. So a lot of this uh, surface area of your brain is given to these organs because they're very sensitive. They're responsible for a lot of the survival, um, your vision, your taste, right? Uh, figuring out if something is poisonous or not good for you. Um, your hands are very important to survival and being able to discern different textures and different, um, being able to manipulate things precisely. Um, so, your body's not created equal. So if your brain didn't know what you looked like, it'd probably look like this, right? So we have, uh, you know, according to your brain, very large face, lips, tongue, hands, and feet. All right, this is number three for you to answer. And let's move on to the white matter. So the white matter in your cerebrum is going to be myelinated, right? So we're gonna talk about myelination in chapter 13, but it, the conduction of the information is gonna be faster when you have myelination. It makes the, the tissue actually look white. So we're gonna talk about these fibers. Um, you only are responsible for um, the, what are called commissural fibers. Commissural fibers under letter A is going to be fibers that connect the right and left hemispheres, connects the two hemispheres. The largest band, so if you look at this picture, it goes across like this. The largest band of commissural fibers is called the corpus callosum. All right, so this really huge band with millions of fibers going across is the corpus callosum. There are two other smaller commissures called an anterior commissure, which you can see here, and there's also a posterior commissure. Here's a picture of the corpus callosum. So if you took a frontal section of your brain, uh, you would see this band of tissue going across like this, right? So that's our corpus callosum, our bridge that goes across the two hemispheres. In this image, you can see now that the two hemispheres have this deep, deep fissure. So this is our longitudinal fissure. And uh, beneath the corpus callosum, we have two spaces. I bet you guys can identify those. Those are our lateral ventricles. Okay, so I'm not going to show this split brain experiment, but I will put it up um, as part of something that you can watch um, in your module. And then again, a nice frontal section of your brain, 
again, we can see the corpus callosum. See how it's white? See how like this inner portion of your brain is white matter? And see how the upper edges are gray, right? So this is the difference between unmyelinated gray matter and myelinated white matter. We can see that deep in the brain, we have areas of gray and we have more areas of white. So the next part of this lecture is gonna look at this internal gray called the diencephalon, okay? So the diencephalon, I'm going to uh, stop this and pick this up later.